Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my talk today, um, as Mina said, is on the gene editing technology CRISPR. Uh, and when people ask me about CRISPR, they usually want to know three things. How does it work? What can we do with it? And should I be afraid? So I'm going to answer all those questions. But first, I'm going to talk a bit about how CRISPR came to be. So here's the story. Since around 1970, scientists had known about a mysterious pattern that showed up in the DNA of nearly every bacteria. It looked roughly like this. So there'd be a stretch of DNA that was a palindrome. This is a gross simplification. DNA is actually comprised of base pairs that are made of letters, but go with me for a second. Um, it would be a palindrome represented by those little triangles there um, that would read the same forward and backwards. Then there would be a stretch of what looked like junk then another palindrome, and so on. And when they first discovered this pattern, scientists decided to name it CRISPR, which was short for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. But they still had no idea what it did. Now, in 2006, a guy named Rodolphe Berenjou was working for a company called Danisco. Danisco supplies bacterial cultures for the yogurt and cheese industries. So they have vats and vats and vats of all the bacteria you need to make blue cheese or camembert or Greek yogurt. And as the person responsible for growing uh, these bacteria, Berenger was very concerned for their health. Something not a lot of people know is that viruses make bacteria sick just like they make people sick. And at an industrial scale, that was a real problem. Every now and then, Berenger would lose a whole colony of really wonderful cheese bacteria to a virus. That year, though, Berenger made a discovery. He figured out that this mysterious pattern, known as CRISPR, was actually a bacterial immune system. Those identical palindromes that were so striking were really just dividers, like you'd find in a file cabinet. And those stretches of what looked like junk were actually bits of virus DNA. Together, they were a record of every virus the bacteria had been exposed to. Now, for Berenjou, this discovery was very exciting. Because these immune systems could be transplanted from one kind of bacteria to another, it meant that he could effectively inoculate his cultures against all kinds of viruses. And in fact, one of the first things he did was take the best, most robust immune system he could find and put it into his favorite yogurt culture to make it extremely healthy. For the rest of the world, though, the ability to make disease-resistant cheese bacteria wasn't the most in-demand technology. Fortunately, not long after, a group of scientists in Berkeley and Switzerland made another discovery. That group was led by geneticists Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. And what they wanted to know was how CRISPR could snip out a very precise stretch of virus DNA and then insert it into its own file on the CRISPR gene. I'm not going to get too technical here, but what they figured out was that CRISPR had two key parts. The first part was a protein known as Cas9 that acted like a scissors, snipping the two strands of the DNA helix. That's why you'll often see CRISPR referred to by its full name, CRISPR-Cas9. The second part was something called a guide RNA, which directed where the scissors cut. There's actually a third part that locked the scissors in place, but don't worry about that. Anyway, after the cuts had been made um, and the new piece of virus DNA was added to the file, a natural genetic repair mechanism would automatically stitch the whole thing back together. So once they figured this out, um, Dr. Downen and Charpentier had a brilliant idea. What if they could take this system and turn it into something that we could use to edit genes? That project took about six months. But the tool they ended up creating, also known as CRISPR, pretty much blew every existing gene editing technology out of the water. Before CRISPR, edit, um, engineering a mouse with a single mutation took a dedicated lab almost two years. With CRISPR, it takes two days. It's basically like having a word processor for gene editing. To edit a gene using CRISPR, all you have to do is give the guide RNA um, an address corresponding to a particular location on the genome. The scissors will then snip out the selected gene or even just a single base pair within the gene and insert a replacement if needed. But the reason CRISPR was so revolutionary wasn't just that it was faster. Something not a lot of people realize is that before CRISPR, gene editing was very messy. For instance, for interest, for instance there was no guarantee that an edited gene would end up in the right place. It was like trying to cut a paragraph out of your document, only to have your word processor paste the paragraph back in a random location. And there were other problems, like you might end up with no copies of a gene in one cell and a dozen copies in the cell next door. Needless to say, this was not ideal. 
One scientist told me that before CRISPR, he had to micro-inject roughly a million cells in order to get a single perfect mutation. With CRISPR, he could do the same thing using just 10 cells. The other thing that made CRISPR revolutionary was that it worked in almost every animal, from silkworms to monkeys, and also in nearly every cell type. Kidney cells, heart cells, you name it. This was a big deal because our old gene editing techniques simply didn't work on a lot of stuff. This is another thing people don't often realize. Did you ever wonder why we do so many genetic studies on mice? It's because mice were one of the few things we could genetically engineer. Most other things were simply too hard. Even rats were hard, weirdly, for reasons that nobody really understood. And while mouse studies have been very useful, in the end, mice aren't that similar to people. That's why you hear about all these wonderful drugs that cure cancer in mice, or treatments that double the lifespan in mice. Finally, one last thing that CRISPR changed was how many genes we could edit at once. Before CRISPR, we could edit only a single gene at a time, and that took two years. With CRISPR, we can now edit dozens of genes simultaneously. And this is important because most diseases are not caused by a single mutation in a single gene, but by many different genes in combination. OK, so that's a brief summary of how CRISPR works and why it's so powerful. Which brings us to part two of our discussion, what extraordinary new things is this technology going to allow us to do? Um, to start, I should point out that CRISPR is still a very new technology. It's only been around for about three or four years. So we probably won't see its real impact for another five or 10 years. That said, even in three years, the promise of CRISPR has really been borne out. And that's especially true in medicine. I'll give just a few examples. First, something that's been in the news a lot lately, gene therapy. The idea behind gene therapy is that you take a small number of defective cells from a patient, blood cells, kidney cells, whatever, you then use CRISPR to fix the mutation, multiply the repaired cells in a petri dish, and infuse the now healthy cells back into the body. At the moment, this is being done uh, mostly for what are known as monogenic diseases, ones that are caused by a single typo in the genetic code. Um, but that's still a very big deal. In fact, the first human trials of CRISPR-based gene therapies are going to start this year um, for sickle cell anemia um, and beta thalassemia blood disorder, and also for retinal dystrophy, um, which causes blindness. But even beyond this sort of treatment, CRISPR has radically accelerated our ability to study the underlying genetics of disease. For instance, until recently, it was essentially impossible to do genetic engineering in T cells, which are a crucial part of our immune response. With CRISPR, we can do that, which means we might finally be able to get a handle on conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or di diabetes. It also means that we can finally begin to explore the genetic roots of complex diseases like autism and schizophrenia, which are thought to be caused by the interplay of dozens of genes. This was something we literally couldn't study before CRISPR since we could edit only a single gene at a time. Finally, one of CRISPR's biggest impacts will likely be in drug development. That's because pharmaceuticals are often designed to correct something that a gene is doing wrong, like making a protein that raises your cholesterol. The hard part has always been figuring out which genes matter the most to a particular disease. And to do that, researchers um, have typically conducted what's called a genome-wide association study. That means they sequence the genomes of a big batch of people who have a disease and look to see which genetic variations they have in common. That's a great approach. The problem is there's so much natural genetic variation in people that it's really hard to tell which one of the hundreds of overlapping mutations is the actual important one, or two, or three. Before CRISPR, it would have taken decades to genetically engineer and test each of these variants to see what effect they had. Now using CRISPR, we can very quickly figure out what each variant does and which ones are important targets for medication. OK, so those are a few examples of how CRISPR is changing the future of medicine. And that alone would be pretty exceptional. Um, but CRISPR is actually impacting a lot of industries as well. Um, in fact, Jennifer Doudna, who helped create CRISPR, has said that she thinks one of CRISPR's biggest impacts may be on agriculture. Um, for one thing, it'll give us a way to make uh, crops that are pest and drought resistant or more, more nutritious without using GMOs. It can also be used on livestock, for instance, to create leaner, more protein-rich meat. Perhaps more importantly, it can also be used to prevent disease. Researchers recently found a way to create a CRISPRized pig that's resistant to African swine fever, a disease that's been really ruinous for farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. OK, besides agriculture, CRISPR is being used for a whole slew of other things. And I can't list them all here, but very briefly, one thing it's being used for is to improve the cellular factories that make biofuels, as Ellen um, Jorgensen mentioned. Um, 
in, there's one case where in a, fair, a fairly simple change doubled the amount of fuel generated um, by a particular algae, just a single simple change. Um, it's also being used in dish soaps and laundry detergents to engineer new enzymes that break down grease and make clothes soft. And I have heard that people are even using CRISPR to breed horses that can run faster and jump higher. I haven't been able to confirm that, so if anybody out there breeds Arabian horses and would like to talk to me afterward, please come up. Um, taken all together, the market for genetically engineered products is expected to double in the next three years to roughly $4 billion. And that brings us to part three of this talk. Should I be worried about this? Okay. The answer to this question is obviously quite complicated, given all the ways that CRISPR is being used. But I do want to address a few key issues. First, when it comes to the medical uses of CRISPR, one of the main concerns has been these so-called off-target effects, where an altered gene can end up in the wrong place on the genome. Um, this would obviously be dis disastrous if it occurred in a human, um, but it's also something that scientists have been working very hard to address. They've known about it from the start, and they've already found a number of ways to significantly lower that risk. That's not to say we should stop working on it, but as one, re but one, re as one researcher told me, it's not as serious a problem as people might think. When it comes to all the industrial applications, it goes without saying that there are going to be a lot of policy implications. For example, a big question is whether CRISPRized crops and livestock should be regulated the way some countries regulate GMO foods. Um, that's something governments and NGOs will have to decide, but a key point to remember is that none of these regulations um, are ultimately going to be about CRISPR itself, but rather about the use to which CRISPR is put. That's because CRISPR itself is simply a tool. It's an exceptionally versatile tool, but still, it's basically the equivalent of a very advanced hammer. You can use a hammer to build a house, or you can use it to hit someone in the head. You may want to prosecute the latter and encourage the former, but either way, it doesn't make sense simply to try to avoid hammers. Finally, one important thing about CRISPR, which is both an advantage and a concern, which Dr. Jorgensen also mentioned, is how easy it is to use. Um, I think a couple months ago, Wired Magazine wrote that CRISPR had, quote, done for biology what the Model T Ford did for manufacturing. It democratized access to a rev revolutionary technology. So to be clear, at this point, we're still talking about a technology that's, you know, relatively easy to use if you're a student in a lab, not just a guy on the street. But still, it means that a lot more people can now do gene editing. And that trend is probably only going to continue. Whether we want to stop that is probably moot at this point, the genie is out of the bottle. As to whether we should be worried about it, that's harder to predict. But I will say that it's true that a defense, an American defense agency recently invested $65 million to study whether CRISPR could potentially be used to create new biological weapons with the goal of creating counter protections. So it's something we'll at least lead to keep an eye on. And speaking of things that we do want to keep an eye on, there's one CRISPR-based tool that I do want to talk more about because it's um, something that really has the potential to reshape our world, um, for better or worse, and that's a gene drive. So many of you will have heard of gene drives, but for those who haven't, a gene drive is a tool that drives a genetic change through a population. Oh, sorry, I skipped that slide. We'll go to the next one. There we go. Um, it drives a genetic change through a population. So if you have a bunch of mosquitoes with white eyes and you want all their offspring to have red eyes instead, just like this, a gene drive lets you do that. It basically guarantees that a particular genetic trait will get inherited. So people had been trying to develop gene drive technology for decades in hopes that it would be used to eliminate malaria. But until very recently, they hadn't had much success. And a key development came when a biologist at Harvard figured out that it was possible to use CRISPR recursively. So that, in, that is to say he made it so that CRISPR would insert not only a new or edited gene, but also the CRISPR machinery itself, all the stuff that does the cutting and pasting. So it was like designing a 3D printer that could make more 3D printers. OK, so what does that mean? Well, the good news is that this opens the door to some remarkable things. If you put an anti-malarial gene drive in just 1% of Anopheles mosquitoes, the species that transmits malaria, researchers estimate that it could spread to the entire population within a year. So in a year, at least hypothetically, you could virtually eliminate malaria. In practice, we're still a few years out from that. But still, 1,000 children die of malaria every day. In roughly a year, that number could be a lot closer to zero. The same goes for dengue fever, chikungunya, and yellow fever. And it gets better. Say you want to get rid of an invasive species, like get all the Asian carp out of European rivers. All you have to do is release a gene drive that makes the fish produce only male offspring. In a few generations, there'll be no females left, 
no more carp. In theory, this means we could restore hundreds of native species that have been pushed to the brink. OK, so that's the good news. Here is the bad news. Gene drives are so effective that even an accidental release could change an entire species very quickly. It's also true that if a dozen Asian carp with the all-male gene drive accidentally got carried from Europe back to Asia, they could potentially wipe out the native Asian carp population. And that's not so unlikely given how connected our world is. In fact, it's why we have an invasive species problem. And that's fish. Things like mosquitoes and fruit flies, there's literally no way to contain them. They cross borders and oceans all the time. The other issue is that a gene drive might not stay confined to what we call the target species. That's because of gene flow, which is basically a fancy way of saying that neighboring species sometimes interbreed. Um, if, so if that happens, it's possible that a gene, guide, gene drive could cross over, like Asian, drive, Asian carp could infect some other kind of carp. That's not so bad if your drive promotes a trait, like eye color, but it could be a disaster if your drive is designed to eliminate a species entirely. Now, I'm guessing this sounds a little frightening, and that's true. But gene drives also have limitations um, that I think, you know, if nothing else, they can make us feel a little easier in our minds. For one thing, they work only in sexually reproducing species, so they can't be used to transform viruses or bacteria, which is very important. Also, the trait spreads only with each successive generation, so changing or eliminating a population is practical only if that population has a fast reproductive cycle, like insects or small vertebrates like mice and fish. In elephants or people, it would take centuries for a trait to spread widely enough to matter. The other good news is that even now, scientists are working to build what's called a reversal drive, one that basically overwrites the change made by the first gene drive. So if you don't like the effects of a change, you can release a second drive to cancel out. They're also working to create other safeguards, like gene drives that peter out after a few generations. So all that's great, but there is still the risk that a country may simply decide to try a gene drive without worrying about all those safeguards. And even if we do have those safeguards, um, this Jorgen, this, uh, as Dr. Jorgensen said, this technology still requires a conversation. If Kenya wants to use a drive on mosquitoes, but Tanzania does not, who decides? Who decides whether we can release a gene drive that can fly? This is where governments and NGOs will have a vital role to play. First, by encouraging scientists to develop these safeguards and reversal drives. Second, by honestly and openly weighing the risks and benefits um, of gene drives based on the best scientific evidence. And finally, by carefully and transparently communicating these findings to the people who are going to be affected by it. I'll be upfront and say this is not necessarily going to be easy. If the anti-vaccine movement in the United States has taught us anything, it's that a lot of people are more likely to trust their gut than to trust scientific studies. Gene drives do have risks, at least in their current form, and those need to be discussed. But the reality is that we also, we currently have diseases like malaria that kill 1,000 people a day. To combat them, we spray pesticides that do grave damage to other species, including amphibians and birds. So it's possible that not using gene drives could be even more dangerous and foolish. That's what we have to assess. All right, I'm out of time now, but as a final point, I just want to note that this technology we think of as CRISPR is not static. It's going to evolve and change. To give you just a couple examples, researchers recently created a new version of CRISPR that targets RNA rather than DNA. That's big news because many diseases, including Huntington's disease and ALS, are caused not by a mutation in our DNA, but by a typo in our RNA. Um, other researchers have created a version of CRISPR that doesn't cut and paste genes, but simply turns them on and off using chemical signals. That means we can now do something called epigenetic editing, as well as ordinary gene editing. It's basically giving us a volume control knob for genes, which is important because in some diseases the problem isn't that a gene is producing the wrong protein, but it's that it's producing too much of it or too little of it. Already this technique has been used to cure both diabetes and muscular dystrophy in mice. I know, in mice, but still. In short, CRISPR is an extraordinary tool, and like all extraordinary tools, it has benefits and risks. Going forward, our most important job as citizens and leaders will be to understand these potential impacts and to discuss them with intelligence and clarity. Whether or not we manage to do that may literally determine our future. <laughs>